So we're here at the Nextcloud conference. You might hear a little background noise of bees buzzing around. Uh, and I'm here with Simon Phipps. Simon, you gave a really, really interesting keynote. Uh, if you had to introduce yourself to the listeners and the, those watching, how would you do that? What would you say? Um, so I, I'm currently training to be a, a grandfather. Uh, and uh, I'm doing that from a base of having worked in the uh, technology industry for nearly 50 years. And um, most recently, the last 15 years, I've been involved extensively with the Open Source Initiative uh, as its president and now as one of its staff. And prior to that, I worked for big evil technology companies. Uh, and I've previously worked on uh, start, helping to start IBM's Java business, and on, uh, I was Sun Microsystems uh, Chief Open Source Officer, so I open sourced Java and uh, Solaris and a range of other things before Oracle bought the company and changed things. One of the exciting things about where I've been working over all these years is you never know what's going to be consequential. It all just seems like a job. And so it always seems weird to, for people to be grateful for anything because I just went into work and did work. Well, you need to have a, 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 a view of the world that you are adhering to. So most of what I've done over the last 25 years or so, I've been convinced that, um, that uh, humanity as a whole needs to have uh, sovereignty over its uh, actions and it's the information about itself uh, and the, the people need to be self-sovereign in software and in data and uh, so I've tended to do things that lead to greater, greater uh, agency and self-sovereignty for individuals and I've tended to avoid things that diminish self-sovereignty and agency for people. Uh, and uh, by doing that, it's kind of accidentally led me, led, led me into things that have been more consequential. Now, I, we, we've celebrated some of your successes in those areas, but would you consider that you've had success or that you know, you've achieved the goals and the dreams that you've hoped to because it, you're still working at this, right? And so is it that there are new problems or that the problem is just so massive that it takes generations, perhaps? Well, uh, so... Uh, I've done quite a few things that I'm, I'm pleased to have been involved in. I think that getting Java started was a good thing. Uh, I think that getting Java open source was an even better thing. Um, I think that helping OSI transform from being a, a very uh, minimalistic, self-board-propelled uh, organization into being a member organization was, was a good thing to have done. Uh, at the moment, I'm mostly working on public policy for OSI. And that was a new departure in many ways. It started in 2017 as a result of being invited to an ITU meeting in Seattle. And I realized there was a, a massive problem, uh, both with the way that some legacy corporations were attempting to manipulate the market, and also in the way that legislators were responding to that attempt at manipulation. And so uh, gradually that has become almost everything that I do is to, to work on understanding who is trying to exert influence, how they're trying to do it, and how we can maintain the agency and self-sovereignty of individuals over their devices in the midst of all that. Well, I'm curious to dive in a little bit more about that influence and how it is shaped in certain ways. Your uh, talk that you gave, your keynote, talked a lot about um, problematic legislation and a host of seemingly unknown problems with the approach. Could you give us maybe a quick tour of that? Uh, okay, so uh, the European Commission uh, over the last few years has decided to embark on what it describes as its digital agenda. And as a result of that has uh, put significant amounts of uh, new legislation onto the books. And at the moment we are uh, swimming in a river of draft legislation which is working through the legislative process. Uh, quite a lot of that involves software and digital devices and uh, the way that it's been framed means that it doesn't really understand the collateral impacts that it's having on open source software. Uh, 
Uh, there isn't any m malice involved by the legislators. There might be some suspicious briefing going on from one or two parties. Uh, but on the whole, it's simply a matter of the parties not being aware of the entire universe of open source software. And uh, so in the talk today, I suggested that's because of the, uh, the view that they have of the world, that they see the world as uh, corporations making things, uh, labor forces staffing those corporations, and then citizens uh, being consumers of their products. And open source is much more complex than that. Individuals within open source play multiple roles. They can be the, the, the party funding, they can be the party implementing, they can be adapting someone else's work, they can be distributing somebody else's work, they can be using somebody else's work. And a, a single individual may play multiple of those roles. And the legislators don't really have any view of the world that allows them to deal with that, what I could term the fourth sector. So the first three sectors are, uh, the, uh, are economic or corporate. Uh, they are um, uh, the labor and workforce. And they are civil society and uh, citizens. And then the fourth sector is the uh, commons-based peer production and the individuals who engage in it globally. And the Commission doesn't really have any understanding that that world even exists. And consequently, as they've been framing all this legislation, they haven't consulted anyone from that world. And so as a, as a consequence, they've naturally, accidentally harmed that world in the way they've framed the legislation. Because it's an unknowing blind spot. that There's no intention there, but of course there is. And I would imagine software is not the only place where those blind spots can show up. I think it's very likely that there's other blind spots in there. And it isn't a complete blind spot. So uh, the, 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 the gentleman who wrote the Cyber Resilience Act, for example, was quite well aware that open source software existed. And he believed that he had protected it. And so he actually came to FOSDEM this year and stood up at the front and told the audience of FOSDEM that the CRA, uh, the Cyber Resilience Act and the Product Liability Directive uh, have uh, exempt open source. Uh, he stood in front of people and said that. And then when you read the act, you discover, well, they sort of do, but they don't. Uh, because the way that he understood open source software was he believed you could distinguish between commercial and non-commercial open source, which is absolutely not the case. Open source does not have any inherent commerciality or lack of it. It is something that can be used in the conduct of commerce. and all open source can be used in the conduct of commerce. So the software itself doesn't have any inherent commerciality or lack of commerciality. And so that very framing is what's led to the, the collateral damage in the CRA. And, and so assuming the CRA passes exactly how it is, what kind of collateral damage would you see? Uh, or are you worried about, really? Uh, th there's really two classes of collateral damage from it that I'm worried about. One of them is of the developers in a community like Nextcloud uh, being treated as if they are the commercial party placing the software on the market and consequently becoming responsible for all of the certification, um, the, uh, the audit uh, documentation that is associated with putting a CE mark on the software which is uh, putting a CE mark on the software is a very reasonable mechanism for the CRA to use, but it should only be the responsibility of co compensated commercial parties. It should not be the associated with, the commerciality is an attribute of the party placing it on the market, not of the software being placed on the market. And uh, so I think that will be one impact is plausibly developers will become responsible for the, uh, for the integrity of the software that's being placed on the market. Second problem is that the bill uh, requires developers to report um, uh, uh, exploitable vulnerabilities to the, uh, the, the, the national authorities in their country. And so this would require Nextcloud developers to, who are resident in Germany to report any uh, defects that they discover to the German cybersecurity authority. And I can see that being uh, something they would be very cautious about doing because in open source development typically you don't tell anybody when you detect a vulnerability until you've fixed it and so having some party that you legally must tell will go against everybody's instincts and practices and the best results for everyone it kind of undermines 
decades of disclosing vulnerabilities and working with them. So I, it's just another example of the complexity of building software as massive communities collaborating together. Um, have you seen that kind of way of building software change from when, for instance, you started being involved? And today, I would imagine it's even more complex. Can you uh, explore that a little? Um, I, I could try. Uh, so I think that open source has gone through, so open source is actually 25 years old this year, and free, the concept of free software is 40 years old this year. I think actually this weekend it's 40 years old. Uh, and um, in the earliest years of free software and open source software, it was very much an individual endeavor. Uh, you expected the people involved to be using the software they're working on. You expected all the people involved to be people like that who are collaborating over software. And uh, as open source software has become more and more a part of the way software is developed, more and more people that are involved are being paid to work on it directly. And uh, some projects are arising which are the, the, the fruits of a single company. And that leads to a different dynamic in communities. As I look across the open source community, I can see examples of all of those uh, epochs of open source still current and, and active. And so the, it's much harder today to make a single statement that's true about the open source community than it was, say, in 2004, when it was, you were fairly clear when you talked about an open source community that you were talking about individuals basically involved in a private endeavor. The examples that weren't that were things like MySQL, uh, but pretty much everything else was, was, a, was individuals uh, working on it for their own personal reasons. Uh, sometimes they were commercial reasons, sometimes they were uh, personal interest reasons, but it was quite unusual then to have large corporations with large bodies of programmers who were only doing it because they were being paid to do it as a day job. And so that brings me to the question, how do you feel about that change? How it's been adopted more so by business? Is that a good thing? Do you see that as beneficial for society in general? Um, I, I think it's a very mixed blessing. Uh, I, I remember about uh, six years ago being with some of the uh, earliest individuals involved in the free software movement, saying how much they regretted that corporations had got involved in, in free software and how they wished they could go back and, and not have that happen. Um, I tend to believe that simply having software under free and open source software licenses is, a, is a, a, an inherent good. And uh, so I'm, I do feel that having companies involved is probably a net good um, for the society as a whole. Um, I, I feel that the things we should be striving for now are not just about the software. I think we need to be striving to have a society where individuals maintain their agency. And I think that is the biggest problem we face at the moment is agency being removed from individuals, both by corporate surveillance and also by, by government action. Uh, I think agency is the big deal. Um, I also think that um, the self, people's self-sovereignty over software is a very important thing. And I don't think that actually free software and open source software automatically gives you either of those things. Um, but it can. Uh, it's, it's necessary but not sufficient, I think is the way to, to put it. So what would you package with it then to attempt to solve some of those issues? Um, so one of the, so uh, <laughs> at, at, a, at a purely mechanical level, um, I think that making sure that uh, the ownership of software copyright is distributed is a, is a great source of good. So I'm a strong opponent these days of copyright assignment. I don't think any software developer should sign a copyright assignment agreement if they can possibly avoid it. And I also think that people should avoid signing broad uh, copyright licensing agreements like the Apache CLA. Uh, certainly an Apache licensed project that is in corporate ownership, you should never sign the CLA because you're just uh, giving your labor to somebody else to exploit. Uh, but I think that distributed ownership tends to lead to better outcomes than concentrated ownership. Um, but I, I think that 
we, we're, we're very much at a turning point at the moment because of AI. Uh, I think that um, uh, statistical models and, and large language models are leading us to a place where I don't think we know what is sufficient to guarantee the self-sovereignty of people in their devices or the agency of individuals over their personal information and the decisions they make in their lives. And I think that's one of the things OSI is doing at the moment is we're running a process to investigate what an open AI would actually look like and what we mean by open source AI. Because it's, it, it doesn't, it's not a defined term at the moment. It's, it's something that sounds good and people are hiding behind it in their marketing activities. But in terms of what it really means, we're very keen to define that. And I want to see that being defined in terms of agency and self-sovereignty. Given your experience, how long do you think it will take to come up with that definition to a point where it's usable and effective? Uh, well, I think OSI's process has been running all year, and I think there's a good chance that we'll have a draft of a description of what uh, leads to a self-sovereign agency-protecting AI sometime in the, maybe in the second quarter of 2024. Uh, the, the, that's now getting, we've got to the point in that where we're running workshops for people who think they know what, what the answer is. And we're going to listen to lots of people's expression of what the answer is and get those people to come together and begin to draft a statement of, of what an open source AI would look like and mean. Fascinating. Uh, thank you for exploring that. You, you mentioned the Nextcloud community earlier and some of the potential issues that some of this legislation might introduce for something like the Nextcloud community. I'm curious for you, why is Nextcloud important in this regard? Is there, like, you seem to enjoy the fact that Nextcloud has been doing some of these activities with, you know, fighting against Microsoft a little bit. But why are you a fan of Nextcloud? Like, why is it important in this realm that you really think is super important for society generally, you know? Uh, so the Nextcloud plays an important role because it is a genuinely open source platform on which it's possible to deliver open source solutions to individuals who are retaining their agency and self-sovereignty. And uh, the problem that you face with cloud solutions is running cloud solutions turns out to be complex and to be something that requires uh, resources on a scale that individuals typically can't muster. And so uh, solutions like Nextcloud, and you know, there's a couple of others out there as well, uh, are really important because they provide a platform where individuals can enjoy their, their agency over what's happening, not find themselves surveyed by, uh, by corporate controllers of the platform, uh, have the liberty to install applications that are themselves open source applications, that allow them to extend the scope of their agency and self-sovereignty into document or collaborative document authoring, into uh, um, messaging on uh, ActivityPub, Mastodon style networks, on uh, photo uh, collection editing. Uh, without Nextcloud, all of those things would happen in somebody's own space. And Nextcloud means that you actually can engage in those activities. So fairly uniquely amongst open source projects, not only does it itself give you agency and self-sovereignty, but it also in gives you the freedom to have uh, the software freedom in other domains, in photo uh, archiving, in document editing, in and a whole raft of things. You've, you've got a huge range of, of um, applications that can run inside Nextcloud. Lovely. And you mentioned during your keynote uh, that there are about 70 or so colleagues you're working with, having Jitsi conversations with on a monthly basis. But you also suggested that it might be important to have those kind of representatives in each large open source business that can contribute in a way. Can you explore that idea a little bit more for us? Okay, so the way the open source community has responded to the Cyber Resilience Act is by uh, self-organizing on principles of um, uh, segmentation so rather than everybody trying to do the same work 
uh, taking a little piece of the work and, um, as, as it were, uh, uh, eating the ele elephant by making carpaccio. Uh, and uh, that has resulted in us forming a very effective organization, which is an ad hoc organization. It's not incorporated. It's not even got a, 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 a constant membership. It's very fluid. And it's meant that we've been able to um, go visit legislators, uh, the co-legislators, and offer them not um, lobbying in the interests of companies, but rather education about the, 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 the good or the potential harm that they might be doing. Uh, and that's worked because, uh, as, as, as you just said, there's, a, there's around about 70 organizations that have got someone with the time to attend a call once a month to make sure that they're aware of what's going on and to, uh, to chip in in some way. I don't know if you know the story of Stone Soup. Um, so they're able to, to you know, put their, their fragments of vegetable or meat into the Stone Soup. And uh, so we've been making Stone Soup around the CRA. And uh, going forward, we're going to more and more need to have activities that are making Stone Soup to correct the overreach or the errors in other legislation such as the AI Act or the AI Liability Act um, and t in order to do that uh, one of the things that has to happen is open source communities need to join representative organizations so obviously I'm from OSI so I would like your community to become an OSI affiliate or your company to become an OSI sponsor uh, because that will then allow me to include you in my activity that I'm doing on policy work. Uh, if you don't like OSI for some reason, uh, Free Software Foundation Europe also has an excellent policy work. work. They have a, 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 a strong and experienced staff and we coordinate with them to make sure that we're not uh, uh, conflicted with each other. So we're able to ex extend the range that we're doing. Uh, in Germany there's the Open Source Business Alliance businesses based in uh, in German speaking countries should join the Open Source Business Alliance and strengthen its voice. It's just done some very effective lobbying. There's a European scale organization called Open Forum Europe that uh, you can join or join as a community member in. Joining in with any of those will let you join in with our, our pool of chefs making stone soup and uh, provide a, a valuable workforce to uh, make sure that the fourth sector, the, the people who play multiple roles individually at scale, are able to affect legislation. So let's imagine for a moment that all of these efforts succeed, that we get legislation that does represent more accurately the way that open source software is produced in our communities and the way that they function. How do you make sure that down the road, the decisions that are made, procurement, I don't know, with, within government, how does that, how do you make sure that it's all working the way that's intended in writing versus what's happening on the ground? So, so that is challenging. And the, the public procurement part has, has traditionally been a big problem for open source because um, there are several countries in Europe that have open first policies on public procurement. And uh, I, I, I won't name any particular countries, but some of those countries uh, it has had absolutely no effect whatsoever. Uh, in some countries it has had a limited effect. Uh, there is a piece of legislation that is in the digital agenda raft called the Interoperable Europe Act, which I believe is likely to make a very positive contribution by instead of mandating uh, open first procurement, what it does is it mandates cross-border interoperability. And uh, practically, cross-border interoperability is much more easily achieved by either using or forming open source communities so that there is shared code. And I think that it's possible that the Interoperable Europe Act is gonna make a, a big difference to public procurement by incenting organizations to do it, not because it will save them money uh, or, and not because it will uh, it, uh, somehow give them sovereignty over their software, because uh, most public authorities don't want sovereignty over their software, they want to outsource it. Uh, but instead, it will give them a motivation because they will, to be compliant with the Interoperable Europe Act, they will need to be interoperable across borders. And 
to, the only real way to coordinate that, you can't tell your outsource, your, your commercial outsourcer you want to do that. The only way to do it is to use uh, a, a common community of code with the other countries in Europe. So I think that's going to make a, I hope that's going to make a big difference. Uh, FSFE are working on that act. They have a, a full-time member of staff trying to make sure that Interoperable Europe Act does good things. That's amazing. Are there other organizations that you think uh, are important in this regard? Um, it, it probably wouldn't be right to, to try and make a comprehensive list because there's quite a lot of organizations involved. I, I think that's actually a good thing, isn't it? Yes. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm routinely working at the moment with... Uh, an, 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 I am routinely working at the moment with NLNet Labs. I routinely work with Eclipse Foundation. Uh, I routinely work with some folk from uh, some French uh, free software organizations. Uh, I routinely collaborate with FSFE. Um, uh, all of those organizations are, are doing essential work, but there are more than that. There's more. We have a, there's about 20 people that attend our weekly meetings. Uh, and I, I, I can't even begin to remember who, where they're all from. I'm, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, because you've you know, been in the game for a few years now. Uh, we've seen the likes of Microsoft and Google, for instance, really embrace open source. Uh, how does that make you feel? Or does it worry you? Where does it lead us? Do we need to change something there? Uh, so I'm, I'm really very happy about the way that's happened. Uh, with Microsoft, Microsoft did actually use open source f f long before they made commitments to it. The commitments they made to it were because it's essential for their Azure cloud product to embrace and accommodate open source. Uh, and the, the rest of the corporation didn't necessarily all run along behind happily. Uh, I think they've now reached a stage where the attitude of GitHub is much more representative of Microsoft. And uh, I don't generally regard Microsoft as one of our most pressing problems. Generally, they are a solution to problems rather than a source of problems these days. Um, Google is completely based on uh, consuming open source software. Uh, they've done pretty good work uh, um, in supporting open source projects. Um, I, there are other companies I'm far more concerned about than Google. Um, Such as? Uh, the, it's the companies that are involved in the telecom sector who are dependent on standard essential patents for their revenues uh, and are facing a world where the things that they're working with are much more from a world where patents are not tolerated. And there is a growing tension between those companies and the uh, open source world as they realize they're going to need to use software and if they need to use software, that means they're going to need to use open source software. And yet, open source licenses make it impossible for them to operate their rent-seeking uh, standard essential patent model. And so th th I'm much more concerned about their actions, both behind the scenes uh, and, and in public, than I am by the actions of, of the usual suspects. Uh, it's, it's interesting in many ways because you come to open source events and people are very worried about Microsoft or Oracle or Google and honestly they're not the companies I worry about anymore. I'm much more concerned about the telecom sector and the consumer electronics sector. Fascinating and so do you see you know there's a lot of enthusiasm around asking hard questions to the typical you know the hard the big five that are typically you know asked about here. Do you see those hard questions also being asked of these telecom services and others that are sort of hiding in the shadows? Uh, no, I, I, I haven't really seen people treating them with the concern that they deserve so far. And I would like to see a lot more uh, difficult questions asked when those companies claim to be fans of open source. Uh, because, you know, while I have my questions about GitHub, and would prefer a decentralized model. And uh, you know, while there are pockets of Microsoft's business that still concern me, um, I'm much more concerned about handset manufacturers and network equipment manufacturers 
and particularly the patent holders from the institutes whose codex and uh, and other software Im uh, artifacts they're implementing. Those are the companies that concern me much more because I think that they, to protect their revenue streams, they need to extend their patent monetization activities into the software realm. And they're not, they're not at all welcome here. You know, they, the idea of one of those companies coming and seeking um, royalties from Nextcloud community members is is positively a, a anathemic, and and I, it is a little bit of a surprise. I don't see them being asked more hard questions, and it is a little bit of a surprise that I don't hear any of the names of those companies being mentioned when we talk about companies of concern to the community. Really fascinating. Uh, is there any other concept or idea that you'd like to share with us today? Um, so uh, during the keynote, I talked about a, a couple of concepts. Uh, one of them I talked about the Mesh Society, which is a concept that I've uh, been uh, uh, very uh, interested in for about 15 years now. That's the, the, the concept of this layer of society that, where people are engaged in peer production, where they're engaged in one-on-one -on -one interaction at scale. Um, and I, I think that concept is a concept I'd like to see more people uh, exploring and uh, being concrete about. And then I've talked here about the fourth sector, uh, about the, the, the people who make up that mesh society uh, and their need for representation. Those are the two main concepts that we've been talking about here today. Lovely. Well, thank you for sharing your insights. I'm curious, this is a Nextcloud conference. You're part of this community. What would you say to others who are thinking of coming to the Nextcloud conference? Um, this is a, 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 a great crowd of people who are very engaging and engaged. And um, I think that people would discover that they were at home here if they were to come along to the conference next year. And, and just looking around, you, you probably can't see it very well in the video, but we're in a, we're in a, a, a slightly grungy warehouse uh, which appears to be a maker space for 3D, for absolutely enormous 3D uh, printers and laser CNCs and things. And I want to come play here out of hours, really. So if this is where you're holding the conference next year, if maybe you could arrange for a maker evening as well. Sounds like a great idea. Well, Simon, thank you for joining us, for sharing your insights and just having conversations with all of us. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to come along.